I'm really delighted to see so many participants doing lots of good work, which was evident in the posters that you have put up yesterday. So uh, today I'm going to talk to you about phonons. And I, I'm sure some of you are already fairly familiar or even expert in the science of phonons. But some of you with uh, possibly background in chemistry or engineering may not have seen this before. So I'm going to first tell you what are phonons, why are we interested in them. Then in the second part, I will show you how to calculate or obtain phonons. During my lecture, don't wait for me to ask you. Now is the time to ask. Yeah. Please stop me any time if you have questions. Let it be interactive. Material. <coughs> you always use some external field to change that material and then measure the change. I will convince you that phonons also play a very important role in giving rise to very interesting properties in a material. So phonons are essentially quanta of vibrational modes in a system, whether it's a molecule or it's a solid. Right? So here I'm showing you a range of frequencies in centimeter inverse in the bottom and in the top they are given in the form of elect elect energy, electron volt. Hmm? H bar omega is essentially frequency. So you will see it starts at around 4000, which is half an hour, half a dB. These are modes associated with heteropolar atoms, bonds. Then you have CH bond around at 3000 centimeter inverse. Then you have triple bond, CC bond or CN bonds, which come up in this range of 2000 centimeter inverse. And then you have double bond, single bond. As you bond becomes weaker, frequency becomes smaller. And it stops around 10 of an EV. Of course, there is much more below that you will see in a minute. But these are frequencies. And you know, if you measure these frequencies, these are vibrational frequencies, you can tell. As you remember from Lubosin's talk yesterday, you can tell what type of bonds are present in your system because they are characteristic of those bonds. Right? That's why phonons vibrations are important. Now, if you take electromagnetic spectrum, you know usually ultraviolet light will break a bond. Visible light will not excite any of these vibrations because energy of visible light is much bigger than half an EV. Right? Uh, it's more than 3 EV. So that will not couple with vibrations, but if you use IR radiation, and uh, that will essentially excite these photons because that frequency of IR electromagnetic wave falls in the same range as these phonon frequencies that you have here. Okay? And if you have microwave, it will give rise to rotational modes, which are even lower in frequency. All right? So frequency is a measure of stiffness of a bond. This is one message I want you to take from this slide. Right? It tells you how stiff is your bond. If it's a triple bond, it's stiffer than a double bond than a single bond. Of course, if you take a crystal, it has infinitely many bonds, right? Infinitely many atoms, and as a result, you have infinitely many vibrations. And because you have a periodic structure in a crystal, all vibrations come as in the form of waves. Those are called as vibrational waves and quanta of those are essentially phonons. Okay? So this is one slide just to give you an example of what phonons of a crystal look like and what you can learn from them. Okay? So with infinitely many bonds, the vibrational wave in a crystal is given in, as a function of wave vector, block vector, which is 2 pi by wavelength. Just like electrons. Electrons that satisfy Bloch's theorem. Phonons also satisfy Bloch's theorem if it's in a crystal. So you, you typically plot frequency of a phonon as a function of wavelength of a phonon along different high symmetry lines in the Brillouin zone. Right? It's very similar to the electronic band structure that you may have seen in several posters yesterday. Right? 
So, but they are very different. I'm going to tell you now what, what is contained in this, and then I will revisit this picture at a later time in this talk. So, first is an example of silicon. You will see silicon has two atoms per primitive unit cell, and as a result, it has six vibrational modes per unit cell. Or at any wavelength, it will have six ways of vibrating, and that's why you have six branches. You see, one, two, three, four, five, six. The bottom, lower frequency branches are called acoustic phonons, and the higher frequency phonons are called as optical phonons. Right? Acoustic phonons go linearly to zero in their frequency as you approach gamma point. Gamma point is the zero, zero, zero k point in the Bengali zone. If you take gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide is very similar in its structure to silicon. Right? Same structure, except for the fact that one silicon is replaced by gallium and another with arsenic. There, you know, the band's phonon structure is very similar, as you would expect, because they are on gallium and arsenic are on the other two sides of silicon. Bonds are very similar. But, indeed, there is a very clean signature that gallium arsenide is different from silicon. It's basically, please note this phonon mode of silicon, it's a triply degenerate mode. On the other hand, in gallium arsenide, as you come to this long wavelength limit, you go into zero, there is a splitting, which is called as LOTO splitting. Okay? So gallium arsenide has a polar character, and that is evident in its vibrational spectrum in the form of this LOTO splitting. If you take magnesium oxide, it's a different structure, rock solid structure. Of course, its phonon spectrum looks a little different from silicon and gallium arsenide. But magnesium oxide, all of you know, is strongly ionic as opposed to gallium arsenide. And strong ionic character means it has long-range Coulomb interactions in the crystal, interatomic interaction, and you see there is a large LOTO splitting at gamma point. Right? So you already learned quite a few things looking at this one once, but I'll come again. What do these green ellipses mean? You know? When typically you know to measure phonons, you use what are called as infrared spectroscopy or Raman spectroscopy. But both of these spectroscopies measure only those phonons of a crystal which are here in this ellipsis, which are very close to the gamma point. And the reason for it is very simple. The wavelength of light that you would use in Raman spectrum is thousand, few thousand angstrom. So if you take its Wave vector, it's essentially zero on the scale of one over angstrom scale. See, this is zero and this is pi by a. A is typically four to five angstrom, right? So this is much longer than the wavelength of light. As a result, Raman and I are basically probe only these specific points. Yeah? Anyway, I will come to this point later, just to uh, sort of motivate you. This is the beginning. So th this is one part. Second, there's a very nice work from India in 1940. The work was done in 1939 by Raman and Nedungadi. And this introduced a concept of what is called as a soft phonon. Okay, so I won't go through this text which is written here from Nature paper. Um, but basically what they found is as a function of temperature, they plotted phonon frequency, then which they measured using Raman spectroscopy. Raman was the expert in those days in this. And he found that one particular phonon frequency drops almost close to zero, and then it disappears above that temperature. Okay? We will learn how that happens. But this was a signature of what is called as alpha to beta crystal structural phase transformation in silicon dioxide also known as quartz. Okay? So this slide gives you a message that whenever there is a structural phase transition in a crystal, as a function of temperature or as a function of pressure, there is a good chance you will see softening of a phonon. Softening means frequency dropping to almost zero. Yeah? And that's also a very important message. You will we'll come to that again later when we study thermodynamics based on phonons. Soft phonons, why are they very important? Okay, There's, they were, of course, observed by Raman in 1940, but the term soft phonons was introduced by Cochrane and Anderson in 1959 and 60. 
Okay? These are typically vibrational modes less than 100 centimeter inverse. And 100 centimeter inverse means about 12.5 mEV. Very small energy scale. Yeah? And this is much smaller than the first spectrum that I showed you earlier. Here we stopped at 10 100 mEV. Here we are talking about phonons, which are below 10 mEV. Very soft, low energy phonons. Now, why are they important? You know, they are very crucial to temperature dependent stability of a material. You know, you can use DFT, first principles calculation, and compare energies of different structures. They, those differences are relevant only to zero temperature stability of the crystal. Okay? Whereas, if you want to study temperature dependent stability of two structures, you really need to pay attention to this because, you know, lower the frequency, greater is the entropy of these vibrational modes, and lower is the free energy. This is the expression for free energy coming from phonons, you know. And I'm plotting this as a function of phonon frequency for different temperatures, you will see. The black curve is for 60 Kelvin, and the bottom curve here is 600 Kelvin. What you see here is a very spectacular fact that phonons which are below 100 milliEV, or 10, sorry, 10 milliEV, 100 centimeter inverse, they dominate the free energy lowering as you increase temperature. So at high temperatures, the stability of a system is completely dominated by phonons. This is general, thanks for asking that question. See, all I do, I'm doing here is, as a function of frequency, at different temperature, it could be any material. And that's why it's a very general message that softer the phonon, greater is its entropy. And uh, maybe I can use board to show, okay, here it's coming anyway. I'll tell you why, why this is so. So why is the entropy so high for soft phonons? Because if you have a hard phonon, hard meaning high frequency phonon, the spring constant associated with this is high and the energy well is stiff. <laughs> For soft phonon, the energy well is like this, very flat. As a result, as you heat up the system, the amplitude of vibration of an atom is much longer, larger in the case of soft phonon. And as a result, you have higher entropy associated with it. It has larger domain of the phase space accessible and hence the entropy is very high. Okay? And so that, that's the reason soft phonons give lower free energy, and that's basically uh, they dominate the temperature dependent stability. Next, smaller the frequency, greater is the response of a material. Now here I am talking about phonons like electrons. Okay, when you say some a material carries electrical conduct current, right? You of course assume that they have to be electrons or holes, right? Here. Phonons are playing similar role, right? I am showing you here a very modern example to understand why soft phonons are so crucial. If I attach a positive charge by a spring constant to this rigid wall, and this is the spring constant k hard, and on the right hand side it's a k soft, okay? Here the spring constant is softer. And if I apply electric field, this positive charge will feel a force to the right. And the spring constant will try to bring it back, right? So at a given electric field, there will be a balance between force, two forces. One is the restoring force of the spring, and one is the force coming from electric field. And you will see, in equilibrium, it will move by a distance d. And in this case, in the soft phonon, the same thing will happen, and you will find that this distance d is much longer. And the reason for it is the displacement of this positive charge due to electric field is Q times E, which is the force applied by electric field, divided by the spring constant. So softer the spring constant, larger is this displacement. Larger the displacement of positive ion, larger is the electric dipole moment you will induce in the system. So this is what gives you dielectric response. Okay. So vibrational mode like this contributes to vibration, uh, dielectric response or many other responses you will see. Uh, in a way where the soft phonons dominate the response. So graphene, another example. I, I, this is to tell you that this is indeed so in the real world. Okay? I'm, I'm going to take example of graphene. All of you are familiar with graphene. 
This is the form on spectrum of graphene calculated using density functional theory. We will come to that in a few slides, how to do that in practice. You will see, although it's a two-dimensional system, it also has six phonon branches because it has two atoms per unit cell, and although it's 2D, it has vibrations in the Z plane possible as well. But one very particular, th peculiar thing you see here is this lowest frequency branch, flexural phonons. These are called flexural phonons because they involve displacement of carbon atoms in the direction perpendicular to the plane of graphene. So they give rise to the ripple formation in graphene. Okay? And you will see now what happens to graphene if you apply compression. Okay? Here I showed you soft phonons which dominate the response to electric field. Now we are going to see what happens to response of graphene to apply strain, stress. So this is what we do. We apply a compressive stress to graphene from two sides and ask what happens. You will see this is the phonon dispersion of graphene. At an unstrained state, of course, you have st stable all phonons are, as you expect. As you apply the stress, you know this flexural phonon branch dips below zero. And that's what is called as rippling instability. So softer phonons are more sensitive or they scuffle more strongly with the external perturbations, in this case, uh, stress field. Okay? So this is the last message I want to give you, that soft phonons dominate response of a material to external fields. So flexural phonon branch, it, it's positive above a cert certain strain, and it becomes negative, meaning phonon frequency square is negative. I will again explain to you what it means. This side of the part, the graphene is unstable. It's unstable meaning it, there is a rippling instability in graphene. And uh, the ripple structure of graphene will be more stable in this part of the diagram. Right? Okay. So let me now summarize what all we have learned, and then we move into calculations of phonons very soon. So uh, this slide is going to take some time, because there's a lot of interesting information to tell you. So this is, again, a phonon dispersion of some particular complicated, relatively complicated material. It could be an oxide, right? And if you remember, it, the acoustic phonon branches, the slope of these phonon branches give you elastic moduli of a crystal. All of you know elastic moduli, right? You apply pressure or stress. How much is the deformation in the, that crystal? That's what the response is given by elastic constant. So slopes of these branches give you elastic moduli of the crystal. And that's why they are called acoustic phonons. Why? Acoustic means sound. And if you remember your high school days, velocity of sound in a crystal or a material is given by square root of elastic modulus by mass density. Right? And that's what is captured here. These are all sound waves, longitudinal sound waves and transverse sound waves. Then you have optical phonons here. These are the ones which you will measure in the Raman spectroscopy if symmetry is allowed. Right? So Raman and IR spectroscopies basically are identifying your material. It's a, it, it, it tells you what is the fingerprint of the material. Now, let me give you an example. You have listened to me for about 20 minutes now. If I step outside this hall and I'm talking to Ranjit, slightly loudly. Would you be able to tell it's me? Yes? Why? How? Sorry? Because of the prediction of our past about Yeah, but in principle, you are using my voice as the fingerprint that it's mesh. That's precisely what Raman spectroscopy does. What Raman spectroscopy does is it uses light waves to listen to the vibrations of your molecular material. Okay? Vibrations scatter the light and scatters changes its frequency, and that change in frequency gives you the frequency of vibration. Okay, so that's why Raman and IR spectroscopies are finger, give you fingerprint, and those are essentially vibrational modes. Umesh, and, even, yeah. even we do that in the these things voice yes in in our uh, we we use voice as our fingerprints yes, yes. 
Absolutely, yeah. And so here we are not talking about fingerprint of a material, which also involves similar ideas, right? And of course, thermodynamic stability of atomic structure. So if you want to get this full form on distortion using experiment, you know, you really have to use inelastic neutron spectrum. You cannot use Raman spectroscopy to get full distortion. Raman will give you only these modes, this and this. And Villoin spectroscopy may give you these modes in the long wavelength limit. Long wavelength limit means wave vector going to zero. Lambda goes to infinity. And that limit is basically in this region. So experimentally, you really need to have a nuclear reactor. And the reason for it is very simple. If you produce neutrons with suitable energies, you know, their wavelength as well as energies are comparable to the vibrational frequencies and momentum. You can understand because nu nu uh, nuclei are also made up of protons and neutrons. The masses are very similar. Okay? That, and it's, of course, very difficult. You can't uh, have access to nuclear reactor and inelastic neutron scattering. On the other hand, this is where the power of these simulations, you will see, is very evident that it, this phonon dispersion I have obtained on my laptop in less than six hours. Hmm? So this is the power of this methodology now. Something which you need a nuclear reactor to get experimentally, you can easily get it on even a small computer for a reasonably complicated solve. Hmm? And why, you will say, well, who cares? Of course, you will see now everything at finite temperature depends on these type of problems. Any questions? So let me give you an example of this fingerprint idea, OK? Just, just to sort of convince you that this fingerprint not only is useful in the way Lugosin talked about in his talk, but it's actually very useful for technology also. In fact, that's the reason why Raman spectroscopy has become a very commonplace tool in nanoscience, biology, and many other areas. So this is where I'm going to tell you about some electron phonon coupling where physics of both phonons and electrons becomes relevant. And if you go to lower dimensional systems, the probability that two particles will, coll will collide with each other is even higher. They cannot avoid. In 3D, you know, you can have lots of aeroplanes flying in the sky without colliding, but you can't have the same density of ships on an ocean, right? That's the idea here. You, you cannot avoid paths of different particles. So coupling between different degrees of freedom is not readily possible in low dimensional system. And here are some two examples, OK? Electron phonon coupling means what? You have an electron moving in a crystal. You have a vibrational wave which comes here. They collide with each other and scatter off each other. So they change their direction. And that's how the electrical conductivity or even thermal conductivity sometimes is controlled by this type of effect. This is a nice example of a conducting polymer taken from Nobel Foundation website. You see what is going on? Here is an electron. It hops from one side to another, one bond to another. And what's happening while it does that? The double bond is also moving along. See, the single bond remains behind. Right? So all of you know the length of double bond is different from length of a single bond. So as this electron moves in this one dimensional, this molecule or periodic structure, it leads to vibrations because the bond length is going to change as that electron moves. And that is a beautiful example of electron phonon coupling. Right? You can see it visually what it means. The second is I'm not giving a picture, but you know this is a paper on cuprates, one quasi one dimensional cuprates, where they say that Phonons and electrons are fully integrated with each other. You cannot even separate them out to understand the physics that comes out of it. So to show you that this fingerprinting of a material is really useful for technologies, this is some work by Ajay Sood in Indian Institute of Science. What they did is they want they are using graphene or MOS2. All of you know MOS2 as well. It's a 2D material. You want to use it in a transistor as shown here. Right? You have a source electron, you have a drain electron, and this is MOS2, which is forming the channel of electron carriers between the two electrodes. And you have a gate, which is at the bottom here. Okay? See, the, one of the key challenges in developing a nano device, electronic device, is how will you characterize what are the, 
what is the density of electron carriers which are contributing to electric current, right? It's not easy. First of all, to look at that using a microscope is quite challenging. And measure these fine properties, particularly when you are applying gate voltage, the number of carriers in that transistor channel changes. So you want to measure how the carrier concentration changes in a transistor when you apply different gate voltage. That's a technological problem, right? And that's where Raman spectroscopy came in. And the principle behind it is very simple. It says, if you change the carrier concentration in MOS2, it will change vibrational frequencies because different bonds, bonding states will get populated, right? So that's what is happening here. Light is sh shining on the, this channel, and then they measure the scattered light to the Raman spectrometer. And the change in frequency you will see here, yeah, these are the results. Experiment by Ajesu's group and my calculations here. You know, certain phonons don't change with this carrier gate voltage or carrier concentration. On the other hand, one particular phonon changes very clearly with carrier concentration. So why why does it use, why is it useful? Because you know, by looking at this plot, I can invert it. I can measure the phonon frequency, change in phonon frequency, and tell what is the change in carrier concentration in MOS. So very useful tool. A tool where I don't have to break the transistor. I can do it very non-destructively. Just shine the light, measure out the light. So it affects only A1G phonon. And that theory really reproduces these results very well. And we will be looking at how to do that right away very soon. So the idea is the large coupling between A1G phonon with electrons is what is crucial. And idea is so simple to understand. You know, once you get a physical field for these phonons and electrons, uh, this is the valence band of MOS2, and this is the conduction band of MOS2, both consisting of these. This is the z square orbital, and this is the x y type orbital. And you know, if you look at the matrix element, this is called as electron phonon matrix element. It scatters electro, uh, electron from one state to electron in another state using phonon as a perturbation. That's the picture I had given you of electron phonon coupling. And this one, what is clear is both of these states have A1G symmetry, and as a result, the phonon which will be sensitive to doping will have to have A1G symmetry. And that's why only A1G phonon changes with prior concentration and not E2G phonon. That sort of is the beauty. You can understand the picture, you develop physical understanding of how the whole thing works. Okay, so this is all my introduction to phonons. I will summarize what we learned. So basically five messages about phonons that I want you to remember. Because when you plan your calculations, you need to know these things. What to, what is your goal? How you want to use these calculations to understand or study your material? That's why this introduction was here. So first is it tells you stiffness of a bond or solid. It gives you elastic formula. Second is vibrational entropy contributes to thermodynamics. And that's why phonons are very important for temperature dependent properties of a material. Three, it contributes to response of a material. I gave you two examples. One was a dielectric material. And I, of course, didn't talk about this, but I'm going to tell you now. Uh, in a, just I'll go back and tell you about thermal conductivity. Next was structural instability. I showed you example of graphene. If you apply stress to it, it develops a rippling instability, which means one particular phonon becomes unstable. So phonons give you idea about structural instabilities and phase transitions. And finally, phonons also constitute fingerprints of the material. You can use it for characterizing, identifying the material. You know, at nanoscale, you may not be able to, but you can always shine light, do Raman spectroscopy, and find out what that system is. In fact, in graphene, it is so successful that you can even measure the concentration of defects, the nature of defects which are present in graphene using this kind of spectroscopy, because the defect also has a fingerprint, and that's what you will measure in using that. Okay, so let me tell you about thermal conductivity. It's a little interesting topic, and of course, I see many talks here on. Um, Thermoelectric. So let me go back here. Okay, maybe this itself is good. You know, in a phonon spectrum, these are acoustic phonons and these are optical phonons. And in most material, uh, thermal conductivity is dominated by these acoustic phonons. You may not believe this, right? 
because you will, when you think of conductor of heat, you always think of maybe copper and then maybe some sponge that you may have used in your high school lab to insulate your pot kettle from something, right? Now, if you say copper is a good conductor of heat, naturally its electrons are very important for that property, right? They have a lot of good free electrons. But can you tell me who's, which is the three-dimensional crystal or material which, is, which has the highest thermal conductivity? Yes, diamond, right? Diamond, which is carbon, diamond that is of carbon. All of you know it's a very good insulator. It has no free electrons at all, but its thermal conductivity is maybe 10 times bigger than copper or gold. How? No free carriers, no free electrons, nothing, but the highest thermal conductivity. And the reason for it is, it is the acoustic phonons which dominate, and I told you, acoustic phonons are related to the elastic moduli, right? Elastic moduli are the highest for diamond structure, right? It's the hardest material. As a result, the slope of this, which gives you the velocity of sound, or group velocity of acoustic phonons, in a crystal is highest in diamond. And since these phonons are the carriers of heat, you know, if you, at the hot end, you will have lots of acoustic phonons generated and they will propagate to the cold end of the material. And that's the mode of heat transport in, in most materials. It's called lattice thermal conductivity and that's completely controlled by phonon problem. Okay? So that, that's what I meant here, that thermal conductivity is also a very interesting aspect of phonon uh, problem. Okay, so how do we obtain phonons from first principle principle? Now that's, uh, we are getting into the real business of doing calculations and then last part will be how to connect it with thermodynamics. All of you remember from Manoj's talk yesterday, this is just one slide to remind you that if you think of a crystal or a molecule, this is the full Hamiltonian in non-relativistic sense, so I don't have spin there yet, but it can always be incorporated in this analysis. And this is a universal Hamiltonian. See, this is one thing I want you all to remember, right? The, th this Hamiltonian applies to molecule, it applies to high DC superconductor, or it applies to graphene, or whatever you take. And that's why I, I call it as a universal Hamiltonian. And then you will say, well, how, where is the material specific part there? Of course, the atomic number here is the, it's, telling you which atoms are made of uh, making of that material, right? And Manoj's talk yesterday focused only on these three terms of this Hamiltonian, right? That's called electronic part of Hamiltonian, which you can do using what is called as born open hammer approximation. So using that, you know, you can solve this ground state problem, and that's where density functional theory comes in. And this ground state energy is a function of atomic number as well as atomic positions. And that's where chemistry and structure of that material enter in this analysis. So the energy function that you calculate using density functional theory of first principle in EFT is capturing the dependence of this energy on chemistry as well as structure in a very unbiased way. There are no fitting parameters there. So E total has all the material specific information except for electronic excitation. And EG is the hard part to determine, and that's what Manoj basically covered in his lectures yesterday. So why is this segment? You know, you should question me. Why why is total energy has all the material specific information other than electronic excitation? And the answer is here. On the right hand side, the second column, I have various properties of a crystal or a molecule, and they are all second derivatives of this total energy. You know? If I take second derivative of this total energy with respect to atomic displacements, I get spring constants of the material, of course constants. That's what is going to be our main topic. If I take second derivative with respect to electric field, I get dielectric constants. So all the linear compliances of the material are second derivatives of this total energy. Okay? Uh, and if you want to get phonons then, 
you will need to have a method which calculates these second derivatives very efficiently. You understand the point? So, so our focus now will be how to get second derivatives of total energy from first class. You will say, well, how does this energy give you finite temperature properties and why where are phonons and how they connect with finite temperature? The answer is here. For finite temperature thermodynamics, you need to use techniques of statistical mechanics. And the simplest thing you can do is to get free energy as a function of temperature and volume using this partition function, which has basically the same total energy that I introduced to you on the last slide. Okay? So the energy which comes out of your EFT calculation is what you will use in this expression of partition function. And then you will get thermodynamics of that material using statistical mechanics. Clear? Any questions? Because many people ask this question. Uh, but your Hamiltonian is not a function of temperature, or your energy is not a function of temperature. Right? How will you get thermodynamics out? The answer, this is very simple and basic concept. Energy that you calculate using DFT is the Hamiltonian of nuclei in your system. So you have that Hamiltonian from scratch. If you use it in statnet, you will get thermodynamics from of it. So you could use molecular dynamics, Monte Carlo, or your choice <coughs> of technique. Okay. So of course, first principles basically uh, gets this from the intensity function. Okay. So in total energy, there are two parts. One is the ground state energy of electrons, and second is class Coulomb classical interaction energy between nuclei, which are positively charged nuclei. And this is the many electron ground state obtained using density functional theory, using one electron problem in effective potential, which is what Manoj stopped at in the last slide of his talk. Remember, it's quantum mechanical calculation, so the computational cost scales as order n cube, although it's a single particle effective problem. And the reason for this n cube behavior, what does it mean? If I double the number of electrons in my calculation, the computer time taken to do that calculation will go up by a factor of 8. That's what is meant by n cube scale. What about memory? Can someone tell me? How does the memory used in a DFT calculation scale with number of atoms or number of electrons? It's n squared. And the reason for it is, of course, you have n electrons, means you will need n wave functions. But each wave function will have to be defined in every space in the unit cell that you have, periodic cell. So you need n grid points with scales with scale with system size. Right? So that's so computer time scales as order n cube. Example of O2 molecule, if you calculate total energy as a function of distance, you minimize this total energy, you get a bond length. The difference between this minimum energy and in energy of infinite separation gives you cohesive energy. And the second derivative, this is what I told you, is gives you spring constant, right? If I take this second derivative, it gives you k, which is basically governing the vibration of the <coughs> molecule. Once you know the spring constant, the vibrational frequency of O2 is given by square root of k by mass of oxygen, right? So all of you are convinced that second derivatives are important, right? Okay. So to calculate phonons from DFT, you basically need second derivatives here. And there are two classes of methods to calculate phonons. One is called frozen phonon method. And in this case, you freeze atomic displacements UI one at a time, calculate hellman fermat forces on every other atom in the system, and then this Kij matrix, spring constant matrix, is basically given by change in the forces divided by change in the atomic distance. And of course, if you have a phonon with wavelength three unit cells, you will have to have a supercell with three unit cells. And I told you the cost of calculation goes as order n cube. If you have to use supercell, the cost will go up drastically. And that's why to get phonons at finite wavelength or finite wave vector q, non-zero wave vector q, 
Uh, you, this method is a little expensive method. And I'll use both to explain to you what, what I mean by this. this what I will do is I will move this atom in this direction this is called as U so the distorted structure this is what is called as freezing upon atomic displacement I off center this atom by a small amount U or let me say delta U maybe about 0.04 angstrom right for First structure, and I have two structures now, one which is given by this atom here, and second where it is, the structure is distorted. And then I ask, what is the force acting on it? Hillman Feynman force. I will come to this point again, how to calculate forces. Um, yesterday, I don't think Manoj covered it, but uh, it should come up again in my talk. So the spring constant here is given by change in the force, this, by up applied displacement delta u. So this could be say 0 0.01 eV per angstrom, and this could be say 0 0.04 angstrom. So this is how you get force constant matrix in eV per angstrom squared, right? You understand the idea is very simple. Now force is a vector in three directions. So this is a component alpha. And this displacement can also be in different directions. So you can have another index here. And basically, this is alpha beta. And you know you, you can also have the four different atomic index there. Ij, atom i, atom j. So this is what a force constant matrix is. It tells you the spring constant between atom i and j in general. For directions alpha and beta, it basically means the force induced on atom j due to displacement of atom i in alpha. Very simple idea, right? Is it clear? And this. As all of you know, let me just complete this. Um, all of you know forces are basically first derivative of total energy. And you are taking derivative of this with respect to another uj beta. So this basically becomes second derivative of total energy with respect to del u i alpha del u j beta. OK? So this is a general definition of a force constant matrix. And from that, you can easily get for non frequencies by defining another matrix where the masses are included as well. <coughs> this becomes the dynamical matrix. And eigenvalues of this give you omega squared. Now you see, if I have atomic displacements which has a double wavelength, I mean two times the unit cell periodicity, then I will need this atom to move in this direction and this atom to move in this direction, for example. If this is moving this <coughs> way, this is. So for that, I will have to have a supercell to calculate that calculation. Okay? And that is not computationally favorable way of doing this, this type of calculation because of the scaling polar and cube scale. Yeah. This one. Yeah. 
See, this is analogous to what I, this is generalization of this expression. For oxygen, I show you, right, oxygen molecule. This is the phonon frequency. So, omega square is equal to k by a, essentially, for oxygen molecule. Now, you have lots of atoms here. So that expression get general, gets generalized. You have Kij by root A. I mean, of course, you also have alpha, beta. So the matrix size is going to be 3n by 3n. Sir, yeah. Sir, the question is between that part, why do we need to consider this person? OK. Uh, maybe I'll just draw the picture. Suppose I'm looking at a phonon which involves displacements of ray atom with a wavelength lambda equal to 2 times a, meaning wave vector is basically pi by a. Clear? In this case, I will assume that it's in x direction. You will see what it basically means is this atom moves this way, this atom moves this way, and then this atom moves this way. So essentially, this phonon perturbation breaks the periodic unit cell symmetry of the lattice. I have to consider two unit cells to fit this phonon because you know this moves this way, this way. Okay. So that's what is doubling of unit cell. This will be my unit cell. If I want to calculate phonons with wavelength this, I have to consider double unit cell. Clear? And essentially, it will basically mean I will have interactions in two unit sets. Basically, covered yesterday. So that's what we will be learning about. It's very simple idea again. And there's a very powerful theorem in density functional theory called as 2n plus 1 theorem. Okay, and. This is basically the theorem applicable to perturbation theory, time independent perturbation theory of within density functional law. So what it says is, for a given small change in potential parameterized by lambda, in our example, that lambda could be just atomic displacement, a small change in the crystal. Con sham solution, both wave functions and energy can be expanded in the powers of lambda like and this theorem says knowledge of consham wave functions up to order m is adequate to yield consham energy up to order n plus 1. Okay? Uh, so basically, uh, if this is where the idea is, I'll, I'll explain to you. So nth order contribution to wave function and energy gives you nth derivative based of the psi. So 2n plus 1 theorem is like this. You, uh, Manoj used this term called V external in his analysis yesterday. All of you remember, in the Hamiltonian, he had three terms, kinetic energy, interaction energy, and external potential. Just to remind you, in my talk also, I had it here. <coughs> this is kinetic energy, this is in interaction energy, and this is the external potential, which is coming from nuclei. If I change atomic position, it's this potential which changes, V external, okay? So I come back here. V external, my reference structure, the first structure that I showed in the bosom phonon calculation is V external 0. That's the equilibrium structure. And then I expand this potential in terms of U. First derivative, second derivative, and so on. Power series. Any analytical function can be expanded as a Taylor series of power series. Similarly, I have Consham wave function, psi i's, right? If I change the crystal by distorting this, uh, distorting the structure with atomic displacement, my Consham wave functions will also change, and I can write Consham wave functions as zero order wave function, first order wave function, second order. Wave function. Likewise, the ground state energy, 
which is the many body counts that you have of electrons, will also go as zeroth order, first order, second order, and so on. Right? All these quantities, I'm just expanding it as a Taylor series. And this theorem says that if I know wave functions up to order n, then I know the ground state energy up to order 2n plus. Very powerful theorem. Maybe when once I show you now what it does, you will get an idea of what it physically means. So if it is if n is equal to zero, n is equal to zero is the usual DFT calculation that you do, ground state calculation, for chance. And that means 2n plus 1 is 1. Right? For n equals 0, this is 1. That means all first derivatives of ground state energy can be obtained from ground state of sun. And all of you have been using this in your calculations. See, whenever you do structural relaxation in BASP or quantum espresso or any other group that you use, it uses hellman feynman forces to do that minimization. hellman feynman force, which I showed you here, is the first derivative of energy. And that's the first example. hellman feynman force is the first derivative and that comes out of zero order calculation. Second example is stress. You know, to optimize structure unit cell size, you need a stress calculation. And stress is the first derivative of energy with respect to strain. And that is also calculated using zero order calculation. So all of these first, first derivatives of energy, you remember earlier I told you, second derivatives of energy give you linear compliance. First derivatives of energy give you also very important properties and these are here. Forces, stresses, magnetization and electric polarization. These are all first derivatives of total energy with respect to magnetic field, electric field and so on. And all of these will come out of your DFT calculation, standard SCL calculation that Manoj talked about yesterday, Gonsham solution. But our goal now is to get second derivatives of total energy. So to get second derivatives, we will have to work with n equal to 1, you will see. n equals 1 means 2 n plus 1 is 3. Actually, this is the power of the theorem. Although I am interested in second derivatives for phonons, it also gives me third derivatives from the same analysis. Okay? So example of it is force constant matrices, which I defined here. It's a second derivative of total energy. And I can do that using linear response. This is what, that's why it's called linear response. n equal to 1 is called linear response, DFT linear response. That will give you force constant matrices, elastic formulae, dielectric constant, mixed derivatives like piezoelectric constants, all the linear compliances that we saw on the earlier slide, the all second derivatives of energy. They are direct outcome of this linear response. Okay? And Raman tensor, which is again I gave you a lot of in, in introduction to Raman. Raman tensor is the third derivative of total energy with respect to atomic position and electric field, electric field. Okay? And these are also immediately available if you do linear response calculation. So that's the power of this approach to optic phonons. Now I'll, I'll open the other slide, but you know, uh, before I go to the next part, uh, I want to highlight the limitation of the frozen phonon approach and the advantage of this calculation. So I'll keep this slide as, of, as here and show you why this problem of What you can show is your first order wave function at k is actually given by e raised to iq dot r times so. 
So there is a block-like factor. So in linear response calculation, this factor can be treated analytically. It's a simple three factor which accompanies the linear response measure. As a result, I don't have to use the two unit cells. See, this is the biggest strength of linear response <laughs> approach. You do not need to simulate two unit cell or three unit cell if your phonon has a wavelength of three unit cell. Because the changes in wave function satisfy block theorem also. So the part which is not periodic is already taken off. And that you can take out from the analysis, and your simulation can work with only these block functions. You know, that's the power of this linear response approach. And you will say, why is it so? Idea is very simple. You know, all of you know that when you have light entering from one medium to another, right? Uh, does its frequency change? Suppose light enters from glass, uh, air into glass. Its frequency doesn't change. Why? Huh? There is a main uh, basic, uh, basic parameter of the... No, why? There has to be some mathematical and simple rigorous reason, right? The reason is you are using refractive index there. Refractive index is related to a linear response property, dielectric constant. So in linear response, you just cannot change the wavelength or frequency like that, you know? E raised to I omega T, to change it, you will have to do square of it, for example. Only then you get E raised to 2 omega T. That's called second harmonic generation. So, of course, any material will have double the frequency also when you shine light, but the intensity will be very low because it's a second order response. In linear response, you will never change the oscillation periodicity in a medium. And that's what you are seeing here, you know. The wavelength of that phonon or the wave vector factor can be taken out of the electronic response as well. And that's the reason we can do linear response calculation of any phonon with just one unit cell. That's the real power of linear response. Now let me come back to the question that Ranjit asked. of the slide. It's called BFT linear response equation. How does it give you second derivatives? Is that what is your question, Or yeah, yeah. All, how does it relate to our usual perturbation? Yeah, usual perturbation. Okay, very good. So to connect it with the normal perturbation theory you all are familiar with, there's a very simple idea to do. I will what I will do, my solution is going to be psi i1. Right? That's what I'm solving for linear response changes in the wave function. So to get this in real, real world, what I will do, I will write this as Cj. I will write linear response wave functions as a linear combination of my ground state wave functions. It's always possible because they span the same Hilbert space. Right? They belong to the same Hilbert space. So I can always write linear response wave function as a linear combination of ground state wave functions. Moment I do that, Ranjit, I'm going to substitute it in that equation now. Okay, you will see what I get. So I have Cronsham Hamiltonian, zero Cronsham Hamiltonian, minus epsilon i zero, sum over j, cj, psi j zero equals HKS1 minus epsilon i psi j 0 sum over p. Right? All I did is I substituted this in the first order Cronsham equation. Now, to solve this, let me put eight notations here. I will take inner product with respect to psi k. <coughs> Right? What do I get? You know, this acting on psi j0 will give me eigenvalue. So this is going to give me epsilon j0 minus epsilon i0 cj delta j0 equals 
because we, these two are not helpful to each other. And I this pass through because that's the Hamiltonian. Yeah? And on the right hand side, I will get basically psi k, you know, let me call this as a perturbation one for simplicity, psi j c. Now you will see Cj is equal to psi k0, in this case because there is a delta function, it will be j, v external 1, psi <coughs> i0 divided by I may be making psi in errors here, but that's what I get. And this is the normal perturbation theory, if you remember from basic quantum mechanics. So these equations, if you solve, you are essentially solving the useful perturbation problem. Now, one sloppy sort of simplification I made is I replace that HKS1 by this. But you know, you will show that this is actually HKS1. is equal to V external 1 plus ground state energy in 1 of So this is the self-consistent part and this is the bare part of it. That's the only thing. Okay? So this, this, this is the content of this equation. Now you will say, well, to do this, to, to solve this problem, this summation is to infinity. Why am I not doing solving this problem using standard perturbation theory? Because if I use standard perturbation theory, I have to sum over 1 to infinity. And I don't have ability to calculate all the unoccupied states. When you do a DFT calculation, you always specify number of bands to be calculated. Right? And that's typically few more than the occupied states or exactly occupied states. So to do this perturbation calculation is very expensive. As a result, what actually there are two ways of getting around it, and that's what basically I'll tell you what is done in the real calculation. Yesterday, Manoj told you that in density functional theory, Eg is variational with respect to charge density, right? Minimum with respect to charge density. Once you use Koncham Natsars, you can also say this is variation minimum with respect to wave function with constant of orthonormality. This is n equal to zero calculus, which all of us do for spectral optimization or standard calculus. Right? This is what we do, really. If you do this minimization, you will immediately show what it gives you is actually quantum psi i 0 equals epsilon i 0 psi i. This is the quantum equation at 0 dot. That's what Manoj covered yesterday. Now what I'm going to show you is very powerful tool again. You know? Here I minimize ground state energy. And in my last slide, you know, I had this expression. Ground state energy is also expanded as zero first order, third, second order Taylor series expansion, right? And this particular part is just forces. Eg1 is the first derivative of total energy. It gives you force on the atom. This one is the force constant matrix. And now you see what is the powerful theorem. If I minimize Eg2 with respect to psi i1 with orthonormality constraint. See here orthonormality constraint was given by this. Here the orthonormality condition is
strength. Very powerful idea again. Variational principle of quantum mechanics also applies to perturbation theory. Not just ground state theory. Here we are saying, if I use the second order derivative of ground state energy, minimize it with respect to psi i's, I get this with this condition. I will have effectively solved the equations on the next slide. If I do this, you know, I will get exactly these equations. H k is 0 minus epsilon i 0 psi i 1 equals H k is 1 minus epsilon i 1 So the real calculation I can just do this way using variational principle and one, uh, there are two codes which do linear response calculation historically for the longest time. One is called Abinet. Abinet uses this idea. This is called variational linear response formulation. You are using, some of you use quantum espresso. There they use what is called as Green's function method. In Green's function method, this summation which I said is the bottleneck is treated using basically the inverse Green's function operator. Okay? So, there are two ways of doing it. This bottleneck of calculation of unoccupied states is tackled using two schemes. One is variational scheme and one is Green's function And there are two codes based on those two approaches. Okay, so the strength of linear response is you can do phonon with any wavelength using the same unit cell. So the cost of calculation is order n cube for a given perturbation. And secondly, it's a variation of principle calculation. It's very fast. The third advantage is, a third point to note is the overall scaling. To get phonons, you, your scaling will be order n to the power 4. Because this calculation is order n cube, but you need n such calculations to get the full force constant matrix that I defined here. So to get phonons, you need order n is to four type calculations. So double the atoms, you know, that's why supercell approach is not a very appealing approach. I have one question. Yes, so in the photon phonon method, yes. do we need to know the symmetry of the material? I mean, no. And but uh, how photon phonon method can be used to uh, to get information about the phase transition? Okay. Now uh, first is. You don't need to use symmetries for any calculation I mentioned here, but if you use symmetries, you will reduce the number of calculations you have to do. Okay? But that is true for linear response also. Um, the second question is how do frozen phonons tell you about phase, tra uh, phase transition? That goes, maybe you may have, may not have been here, that I told you when I introduced this phonons related physics, you know. Uh, a material, this is a structural phase transition from a stable phase to unstable phase. And the signature of it is basically in this phonon frequency less than zero square, omega squared less than zero. So when you have phonon frequency calculated using any technique, whether it's frozen phonon or linear response, doesn't matter, you will be able to tell if omega squared is less than zero, it means your system is unstable and it will end up to Yes? One can just calculate the vibrational energy and add it. Sorry? Vibrational energy can be calculated and added to the static energy. Yes, that is called zero-point energy. Uh, I, I will come to those things very in, in the next part here. Yeah. So at zero temperature, that is called a zero-point energy. But the same expression applies to finite temperature. So you can get free energy also. Okay. So the, I think we can take a few minutes break now uh, because I, I have known the next part is little technical again. Just two minutes break. Outline, I will first introduce to you this. Basically it will be similar to what you saw already on the board but no precise formulas will be there on the screen because uh, they are all already written down. 
Uh, second is extended periodic systems versus confined systems. How do we simulate them? First of all. Third is interatomic post constant constants of the extended periodic systems and crystals. And the last part will be thermodynamics. There are three levels at which we will talk about this. First is harmonic description, weak unharmonic description, and then highly unharmonic description. Okay. So all of you remember from whatever I have told you, vibrations are very important. They can be measured using the spectroscopy. They are relevant to thermal property. And the force constant matrix, now I am writing it very precisely here. Between two atoms, K and K prime, moving in the directions alpha and beta are basically the related to the derivatives of forces of all atom K in alpha direction with respect to displacement of atom K prime in beta direction. Okay? That's the definition of force constant matrix. So frozen phonon calculations, basically you can calculate using energy differences or force differences. And in linear response calculation, which I talked about at length in the last 10-15 minutes, uh, basically you will be calculating this matrix analytically as the second derivative of this matrix. And eigenvalue of this dynamical matrix, this is called force constant matrix. And the dynamical matrix D is basically related to force constant matrix by this trivial mass matrix. And once you have D matrix, its eigenvalues give you phonon frequency square, mu is the phonon level, and uh, when, uh, eigen vector of this matrix, which will be n dimensional vector, will give you the normal mode eigen vector of that phonon. Okay? Uh, one of you asked me outside the hall, how do we lab give labels to a phonon? You know, in earlier slide, I have A1G phonon, EG phonon. Again, it's related to the last question you asked. In electronic case also, you talk about EG orbital, T2G orbitals, right? How do you determine that? In electronic case, you must have seen it more pretty clearly, right? You take a D orbital in an octahedral environment. In octahedral environment, it has a cubic symmetry. You ask a question, how does that D orbital transform under the symmetry operations of that cubic octahedral field? By looking at the properties of the transfer symmetry property, you give a label to that object using what is called as a character table in a group theory. They are all available online. Okay? So in phonon case, you do the same thing. Instead of orbital, for example, let me uh, draw a picture. In the case of octahedral uh, structure, Suppose you have titanium, oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. This is same as the octahedral environment. You know, if displacement of this node is this way, where the titanium atom moves along z axis and oxygen atom moves along this axis. This is a normal mode. Of course, that it, it repeats to the lattice. That's why it's called gamma point phonon. This phonon has a label P1U. And if you look up what it means is, it transforms like a simple three-dimensional vector, like x, y, z components. This has a z component. So likewise, you will have a phonon with uh, displacements along x direction. You can also have displacements along x direction, you know, and then oxygen will move like this. That will be a T1 U with a X polarization. This was one with a Z polarization. And since you have three directions, you have T1 U mode, which is strictly linear. Meaning, there will be three phonons with identical frequency, triple region bursting, and they will be related to each other by essentially coordinate transformation. And that gives you the symmetry level of that phonon for T1. A1G phonon is very special. A1G phonon means any symmetry you apply to that normal mode, it does not change the symmetry of your, uh, it doesn't change the structural symmetry. Okay? So what, uh, let me give you an example. For instance, if you have MOS2, right? All of you are familiar with structure of MOS2, so I won't go into detailed picture. 
But if suppose you have a pronoun in which sulfur moves this way, other sulfur moves this way. Molybdenum doesn't move. This is a normal mode, right? What does it do? It only changes the bond lengths of MOS2. It does not lower the symmetry of MOS2, right? And that's why this pronoun is called as A1G. A1G mode means it remains unchanged under any symmetry operation of that. Here, if you see, it lowers the symmetry. It does not have an inversion symmetry. One side and one side. And that's why it's called. It breaks inversion symmetry. Okay. Fine system means. You could have a molecule, you could have a cluster, or surface even, and of course number of vibrations is always three times in a and per unit cell. And the first constant matrices between two atoms directly relate to their interaction. So if you have a cluster, you no longer have infinite right? Or of course surface is a different thing, but in a molecule, your first constant matrix directly gives you the interaction between those two atoms. But if you have a periodic structure, there are periodic images of that atom also. So the interaction, the string constant between two atoms also includes contributions from the periodic images. So extended periodic system like a crystal, the number of vibrations are infinity, but they can be grouped into three times NA per unit cell, NA per wave vector, which belongs to the Milwaukee cell. Just like electronic case. Right? Electron, the crystal has infinitely many electrons, right? But you also have infinitely many bands. What is infinite is the wave vectors. There are infinitely many wave vectors possible within the Brillouin zone. Number of bands which are populated by electrons is finite. And the same thing applies to phonons. You have three LNA bands, but wave vector is a continuous vector belonging to the Brillouin. OK, so first constant matrix between two atoms depends on the interaction between them and their images. That's the point I'm making here. For instance, you have atom 1, atom 2, interaction between them will also have contributions from this atom, which is a periodic image of 2, and so on. So, phonons in a periodic system, which is basically, again, I explained to you in the introduction, phonon bands are analogous to electrons, where omega is a function of wave vector q, and it has a label band label L, L goes from 1 to 3 and 8. Eigen vector of a phonon is again a 3n dimensional vector, right? It has atomic level k and wave at every wave vector it has i going from 1 to 3 n a phonons and l is the band eigen vector. So aij matrices we, we will be calculating using AFT linear response using the formalism that I described to you earlier. So interatomic force constant matrices are basically, this is in real space and this is in Q space. Now this is the difference, okay? Uh, when you do a linear response calculation, meaning density functional theory of a phonon, you <coughs> always tell the wavelength of a phonon when you do that calculation, because for that, that's where, where the Q vector comes in. So DFT linear response will be giving you this force constant matrix in Q space. Then, to get real space force constants, like in the molecule, you don't have to do this step at all. You have to do what is called as inverse Fourier transform. If you do inverse Fourier transform, you will get real space force constants. See here, zero and capital R are the real space direct lattice vectors. So assume that interactions are short range, then basically this is the formula that we Unfortunately, interactions are not short range particularly in ionic systems, like magnesium oxide that I told you earlier. Uh, when you have ionic system, you have infinite range interactions, meaning atom in one unit cell interact with atom in unit cell infinitely far away. Okay? That's where the tricky part comes in. And that's basically where you, you will be doing some very clever tricks in uh, tackling long range interactions. So what do we do in infinite? Length interactions, we want you can't list infinitely many string constants, right? That's not going to be practical. So, what we do is a very clever thing. We say 
the long range interactions in a crystal will be treated using analytical form of dipole dipole interactions or Coulomb interactions. Whereas short range interactions will be truncated up to within two units. That's the idea. Okay? So decompose the dynamical matrices into long range part treated analytically and the remaining is the short range part. This is treated using Fourier transform that I showed you here. Okay? And then for insulators, long range interactions are manifest in LOTO splitting. I explained to you on the first few slides what is LOTO splitting. It's present in gallium arsenide but not in silicon. And the reason for it is gallium and arsenic are polar atoms. They have long range interactions due to the nature of the ions. Whereas silicon doesn't have that covalent interaction. So that's basically treated using, short range is treated using Fourier atoms. So dipole-dipole interactions have this analytical form. That's the great simplification, okay? A dipole-dipole interaction is basically given by bond effective charge times wave vector divided by electronic ionic. So these depend on two quantities, bond effective charge and electronic dielectric. Again, I, I should explain to you what they are. They are also very interesting properties. <coughs> Z star. You see, Z star, since it's a charge, it has to belong to atom K or kappa. And it is a tensor, you will see in a minute, it has Cartesian indices XY. And what it means is, it's, a, it's also a second derivative of total energy. It's a negative sign. It's a second derivative with respect to atomic displacement and electric field. You can write it as first derivatives also by using this formula. Force acting on atom K in alpha direction induced by electric field in beta direction. And it, it can also be written as derivative with respect to polarization by electric dipole moment with respect to atomic. Okay, now you see the beauty of this. We learned that many measurable properties are second derivatives of total energies, right? But they also give you physical picture of those measurable properties in a very nice way. This is a nice example to illustrate that. First, let me focus on the first formula, right? You have gallium atom here, arsenic atom here, in your gallium arsenide work, uh, things like that. You apply electric field to it in this direction. What will happen when you apply electric field to gallium arsenide? Of course, electrons will polarize, right? You will get an electric dipole moment. But because gallium has a positive charge, it will feel a force, force in the same direction as electric field. Arsenic being negatively charged, you will see forces in the negative direction. And this force is exactly equal to the bond charge that I calculated times the electric. That's the content of this formula, right? Linear response. What is the physical content of this formula? Suppose this is your gallium plus, arsenic minus, and you somehow excite a optical phonon in gallium arsenide, right? Optical phonon means gallium moves this way and arsenic moves this way by minus u. When the two charges, opposite charges, move in opposite direction, they will create a dipole moment, right? Dipole moment is charge times displacement. 
and that's what is the content of this formula. Dipole moment induced in beta direction by the motion of atom K in alpha direction. Right? So both of these, uh, so bond charges is related to this second derivative. Likewise, there is the, in the bottom there, there is epsilon alpha beta. Electronic dielectric constant, which is essentially It's related to the second derivative of total energy with respect to electric field. Now the beauty is this. This is a mixed derivative involving atomic displacement and electric field. This is derivative with respect to electric field, second derivative. So when you do linear response calculation, calculate phonons of say gallium acetide, you will not only use atomic displacements as perturbations, but you will also use electric field as a perturbation. Right? So once you calculate electric field, you know you will get these mixed derivatives as well as dielectric fields. So and if you want to do it using frozen phonon method, of course this will be complicated. Then you will have to calculate forces on the atom by applied field, which is not easy. You cannot apply electric field in a periodic structure in a simple way. So you end up using this formula for frozen phonon calculation. You change freeze atom displacement in atom K in alpha direction and calculate the change in electric dipole moment. That will give you bond charge. But epsilon infinity is another thing again. And that, see that's the reason I personally favor using linear response calculation to frozen phonon, not only for efficiency, but because all these quantities come out just from the same set of calculations. You don't have to do additional work for that. Once you have these two quantities, by the way, this is essentially square of the refractive index. So if you calculate epsilon infinity using EFT linear response, it's not the square of limit. So simply looking at the phonon branch structure, how can we say there is a yellow to Okay, good question. Again, I will have to go into figure for that now. And you, you may not have uh, expected this, okay? Below you are splitting in one other example. At gamma point, which is 0, 0, 0 wave vector, that is strictly infinite lambda, lambda equal to infinity. All three directions are the same, x, y, z. You know whether gallium moves in x direction, y, or z doesn't matter. So you have a triply degenerate for non here. Okay? And this triply degenerate for non continues as transverse optical phonon, which is doubly degenerate, as you go away from that q equal to zero. But the yellow phonon actually splits up. Yellow phonon frequency has a discontinuity in its spectrum, meaning at q equal to zero, there is a sudden dog. There is a hole here. There is no data point. OK, this is singly degenerate. So, Triply degenerate phonon splits into 2 plus 1, but with a mathematically discontinuous behavior. Okay? And this, your question is why is it only at q is going to 0 limit? Right? That's the question. So if I say I take lambda equal to 2a, right? I have plus charge, minus charge, plus charge, minus charge. This moves this way, this moves this way, this moves this way. Sorry. So what happens is dipole moment in one unit cell is positive, and dipole moment in the next direction is negative. So there, you know, it cancels out. So relative splitting effects, which are related to this long range interactions, are weak once you go away. From it. On the other hand, if I'm in this q going to zero limit, q going to zero means lambda going to infinity. You know, the dipole moment here is plus. Next unit cell is also plus sort of plus for a long time. And that's why LOTO splitting, you will see predominantly at gamma. Clear? Basically what is left is a short range interaction. And then that is treated using Fourier transform. So these are the steps that we follow when you want to calculate phone on dispersion on a crystal. Mind you, whatever I said here, 
This is only for polar insulators. Okay? Moment you have a metal, you don't have to worry about long range interactions at all. Because for met in metals you have free electrons. So even if you have a charge which moves this way, free electrons form a cloud around that charge and screen that charge. So at infinite distance away, other atoms do not feel any change associated with this. So in metals, you do not have long range interactions. You don't have to worry about this complicated step. But if you are thinking about MOS2 or silic uh, gallium arsenide or zinc oxide, these are things you will not be able to avoid. So these are the step, this is sort of a step by step procedure to calculate phonons of a crystal. So obtain phonons at a at wave vectors on a mesh N1, N2, N3. Of course, what I'm assuming here is you have done a zero order calculation first. To do any perturbation calculation, you need to have done a zero order calculation. If you remember, the Kornsham equations at first order also involve wave functions at zero order. Right? So zero step is you complete your self-consistent field calculation using ground set then DFT Kornsham field. Then you do linear response at wave vectors on a mesh, N1, N2, N3 mesh. Just like for electrons, you give a mesh, right? The 8 by 8 by 8 mesh. For phonons, we typically give 2 by 2 by 2 mesh. Unless you are expecting that you, have, you need a very high resolution in your phonon disposition. Next, use epsilon and ZFK bond effective charges. Obtain from DFT linear response at gamma to model dipolar interaction, which was here on the last slide. Three, take out this long range interaction from the post constant matrices that we calculated using DFT linear response. So, what you are left with is first principles, short range post dynamical matrices. Once you have the short range post constant matrices, we use Fourier transform to obtain real space interatomic. At the, at the end of this, you know, you have both the you know, interatomic post constants. One is dipole dipole interaction, which is coming from here, and short range part, which is basically Fourier transform. So once you have these states, you can calculate phonons at any arbitrary wave vector. And this, this is this. Once you have phonons at any wave vector or a fine mesh of Q points, you can basically uh, do thermodynamic space. That's what is the next one. Okay, so this procedure is called Fourier interpolation. Fourier interpolation means we calculate post constant matrices on a at wave vectors on a finite mesh. Given. Now, just like when you plot electronic band structure, what do you do? You specify lots of points, right? K vector points, and then do non-self consistent calculations to plot the band structure. For phonons, that's not necessary because you, your Hamiltonian is basically given by this closed constant matrices. All you need is that closed constant matrix at any wave vector Q. And for that, we basically do this Fourier interpolation. Between the two mesh points at any wave vector, we can calculate using this analytical interpolation. Is it clear? If you have a metal, like aluminum or nickel titanium, you will not bother about step two, step three your interactions will all be short range interactions. So that's a very simple calculation for me. Any questions? Yes, absolutely. In fact, if time permits, I will tell you about those. Any other questions? So in summary, electronic calculation of metal is harder than for insulator, but phonon calculation is easier for metals than because the reason is electrons are screening the long range interactions. Okay, so once you do that, we are ready to do thermodynamics. Okay, that's the last part of my talk. Uh, so phonons are primary contributors to thermodynamic properties. Of course, electrons also are important in metals at low temperatures. <laughs> Many properties depend only on phonon frequencies, not on phonon eigenvalues. So once you have frequencies, you know you can get phonon density of states. And from that you can calculate many of the properties. 
So this is normalized phonon density offset, just like you have it for electronic phase. So from phonons, you can write partition function as this. This is the standard expression from statistical mechanics where we use phonon as a simple harmonic oscillator and calculate this partition function. Once you have partition function, you are ready to calculate free energy. You know, this is the free energy of your structure. Now, this is basically what you will add to the ground state energy calculated from EFT calculator. And that will be your total free energy that gives you finite temperature properties of the Internal energy, also you can do, this is basically taken from Ashcroft and Norman, standard textbook work. You can calculate it using phonon density of states using this simple form. Specific heat, again many of you would be interested in. Again, it's a very simple formula in terms of phonon density. Okay? So once you have phonon, all these quantities are immediately accessible to you. Entropy is again related to the same formula. So note that phonons you can hear are within harmonic approximation. One can obtain free energy, you raise all of these things, but no thermal expansion. Because thermal expansion is a unharmonic result of unharmonic interaction. Right? So to determine structure, bulk modulus, and all as a function of temperature, one has to include unharmonic interaction. Phonons, a simple approximation is called quasi-harmonic approximation where you know I can calculate phonon dispersion as a function of volume of my unit cell. Right? That gives me Grunaisen parameter and then you can get thermal expansion coefficient. Also, by calculating phonons at different volumes of the system and getting free energies and minimizing that free energy at the minimum. So let, this is what is thermal expansion physics. So V of T is determined using quasi-harmonic approximation. And this alpha, the linear thermal expansion coefficient, is basically linked with the phonon density of states and this normal goes like that. Uh, atomic temperature factor, basically, these are linked with the extra diffraction, which are also measurable by by Waller factor. They are all related to phonons. Okay? So a lot of interesting temperature dependent properties can be obtained using phonons in harmonic or quasi-harmonic. Local harmonic approximation is another one which was introduced by Richard Laser in 1989. This is a much poor man's phonon approximation, where you know they, one works with only the on-site local vibrations. You don't worry about the full long-range interactions and so on and so forth. You will just calculate the on-site on interactions, the string constants, and calculate it. This approach is very popular among engineers where you know, they work with much bigger structures and then you won't be able to calculate atomistic telling uh, the phonon. So stress and electric field, this is where I want to see one of the messages I gave you in the beginning of my first lecture is phonons, just like electrons, contribute to properties that you measure. Dielectric constant, you know, uh, of course, the one I derived here on the board is electronic dielectric constant. It's also called as optical dielectric constant. And that's why it is refractive index squared. But when you measure the capacitance of a dielectric, that's not the dielectric constant you will measure for polar system. There, phonons will also contribute to the dielectric constant using the same formula I have, because phonons give you electric type of moment in the response. So there, you know, this is the expression one uses. And from this, you can calculate uh, phonon contributions to dielectric constant, piezoelectric constant, and so on. Okay, so the last aspect of thermodynamics. So so far, everything was simple. Your material is like silicon, gallium arsenide, or nickel. These approaches will work beautifully well. But if you are looking at something like barium titanate or nickel titanium, they change their crystal structure as a function of temperature. And you know, change in the crystal structure is the result of very strong unharmonicity of the crystal. And there, these approximations will not be wrong. So there you end up working with much more uh, think, uh, detailed approach, which I will come to in a minute. If, well, I have 15 minutes. So I'll see how much I can cover there.
okay? And then basically we end up using molecular dynamics of Monte Carlo. I'll, I'll go into this in detail. So to summarize, uh, phonons give you thermodynamic properties. They are often using interatomic force constants, which are second derivatives of total energy, which you calculate within DFT. And interatomic force constant matrices uh, basically are of periodic systems are broken into two parts, long range and short range. They give you access to full phonon dispersion. And from that, basically, you can do thermodynamics within quasi harmonic approximation or harmonic There are some references which are used for this presentation. But yeah, I have one more presentation, but I won't finish it, OK? But see, I did not cover this last part, where you have very strong unharmonicity, OK? Sorry, somebody wanted to go talk this. So for highly unharmonic problems, which involve changes in the physical structure, you follow a different path. But then you really need to work with phonons for that also. So I have little time left. And I'll just give you a flavor of those things. It's a full talk, one hour talk, but I don't think I can finish it. So examples. You know, best way to tell you how this approach works is to give you some simple examples, and they are all from my research. Work. So silicon carbide, it's, it's a very well-known material, very technologically important material. And you know what? It's important because it, it's, a, it's promising technological material, both as a bulk and nanoscale, because it has many polytypes possible, which are linked with different stacking sequences of silicon and carbon and in narrow form, you can make super lattices from the same material. So you don't need to have a sophisticated epitaxial growth, right? You can grow different uh, polytypic forms of silicon carbide and make quantum wave structures like this. So it's a very promising material. In fact, uh, like any other material, by the way, silicon is so popular and commonly used because it's possible to grow silicon with a very low defect concept. So when there was an effort by Toyota company, they could grow silicon carbide with ultra high quality. It was a nature paper, and they used very nice technique of rotating the crystal while growing so that no defects are minimized. So this was a very milestone paper, and after that there was a BBC news article, door open for silicon replacement uh, with silicon carbide because you could grow very high quality silicon carbide using this method. But unfortunately, in the same year, there was a PRL which shows that there's a stacking fault which forms. When you use silicon carbide in a diode, for example, after several cycles of operation, it leads to mechanical failure. And that's linked with the structural change in this material. Basically, defect starts forming due to heating. And that's what we wanted to study using DNA. Now, you see, it's a problem which occurs only at finite time. You can't use just ground state theory to predict what happens. And that's where we use this. Whatever you to learn today is enough to tackle this problem now. So that's where we look at stacking fault in silicon carbide. Stacking fault is basically you have a perfect bulk crystal, which is given like this. And using two colors to show lower half and upper half. And then I slide the upper half of the crystal with respect to lower half. And that's how I introduce what is called as a stacking. This is unstable stacking. And if I look at the energies of this sliding as a function of delta, I get a mini local minimum, which is called as intrinsic stacking. Okay? This is the simple physics of formation of this planar. Stacking fault is a planar defect. Along one plane, the registry of atoms changes. That's the simple idea. But how does it happen? It happens as a function of temperature. At low temperatures, you don't have these forms. So that, that's where we use whatever I told you in the last slides. Basically, we use calculated internal energy using DFT, configurational entropy using this simple formula of different lasers, and vibrational free energy using this quasi harmonic approach. And that gives us free stacking for free energy. And you know what we found is very interesting. This is stacking fault energy as a function of temperature. Sorry, this quality is not good. 
but it becomes negative at a 250 Kelvin for one polytype and then 600 Kelvin for another polytype. And this is a result of entirely full on contribution to the not chemical bonding directly. Okay, it's not an electronic thing. So, phonon contributes to the free energy which make it negative and as a result what happens is as you heat up silicon carbide it will start forming these bonds. So although the Toyota researchers make silicon carbide with very low defect density, once you use it in a diode then the temperature goes up and current goes through it, it starts forming these type of bonds. That was the simple explanation of how this happens. And in fact the beauty of this is you can go to the bottom of this droplet and you find out that there are soft phonons for the stacking fault density. This is phonon density of states. And what we show is there is a frequency below about 100 centimeter inverse, which comes up in silicon carbide stacking phonons. And that dominates the free energy at higher frequency. As I explained to you on the slide 3, to be correct. Right? If you take carbon, which is diamond <coughs> structure, that doesn't happen. You see, this stacking fault of carbon doesn't have any soft phonons. As a result, this problem is very specific to silicon carbide. So that's the other aspect of the principles calculation. You can really pinpoint which material will develop such issues and which will not. Okay, I think I will stop here. There are two more talks which basically link, uh, link to the structural phase transition where you know you uh, challenges are quite amazing. Uh, phase transition occurs only in the last <coughs> size limit. Only when the crystal is infinitely large you will get a good phase, sharp phase transition. So Monte Carlo molecular dynamics using DFT is just impractical. So that's where we develop basically an approach which I don't have time for. But you know, if you are interested, I can show you how to do it. It's possible to predict phase transitions using uh, this. And see, these are very fascinating phenomena. Yes. Just to give you an idea why phonons are so interesting, this is a piezoelectric material. It has this polarization versus electric field hysteresis. It has a ferroelectric phase transition. If you hammer it, it blows a, <coughs> blows a light. If you apply electric field, it creates sound waves. So the speakers in your mobile phone are essentially based on this effect. Right? You apply electric, such high quality sound comes from such a tiny device in your mobile. Have you wondered where it comes from? It comes from phonons. Phonons of this crystal. Uh, it, it will take it's a lot of things. I will stop. So, but this is to sort of stimulate thoughts to human students that such very interesting macroscopic phenomena arise as a result of phonons, the mechanism which is more phonons. And those are available from our DFT calculations. I'll, I'll stop here. There may be questions that you can be happy. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. means in the language of phonons that we developed in the last two hours is 
phonon is basically linked with second derivative of towards the end of the CCU. In this case, it is greater than 0. It's a positive parabola. If you take here, it's a negative parabola. It's a negative uh, downward parabola, negative parabola. And of course, you will all realize that this is an unstable point. If you put a ball here, it will remain where it is. But if you just give a little perturbation, it will go down and go, go to this place. This is a stable point. Because here again the k is greater than 0. Okay? So what it means is, at low temperatures, you will have your crystal in this structural state, not here. Because at low temperature, it will go to the minimum energy structure. But you work with this structure. This is typically high symmetry structure, which is unstable at 0 Kelvin. So what it means in phonon language, again, is if I plot phonon frequency squared associated with these phonons as a function of temperature, I will find it goes to 0 and then and the beauty is, this is this curvature, negative phonon frequency. Okay? And of course, that's an unstable structure. So at zero Kelvin, you will not have that state structure stable. But up to some temperature DC, this structure, high temperature structure, this structure is called high temperature structure. It can be stable due to, again, vibrational phase. So thermal vibrational free energy stabilizes the high symmetry structure above this. This is high symmetry state. This is low symmetry structure. Low symmetry means atom is off-centered from the high symmetry state. Okay? So this is what means what is meant by omega square coming to be negative in your DFT calculation. That means your structure is unstable. Now your question is if you change k points, you get what? Well, so that question I didn't understand. That sounds like a numerical issue. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, a numerical issue. So, yeah, so you, you have to increase number of k points as large as possible to get converged results. If your results are not converging, there is some problem with the calculation. But these frequencies converge if you increase number of k points. Okay. So what about supercell size, I mean? There is no supercell involved now. If you use linear response, okay, okay. there is no issue. That's true though. If you use boson for not, yeah, it will yeah, depend. Yeah. In linear response, let me be a little careful in responding to that. I showed you. Sorry, can you connect to us? Where, so you will be wondering where did the supercell idea go in the linear response calculation? And calculation of phonon spectrum, you calculate it at wave vectors on a mesh, n1 times n2 times n3. In frozen phonon case, that's the supercell size. Okay? So suppose I use 2 by 2 by 2 mesh for phonon calculations, it means I'm using 2 by 2 by 2 supercell in frozen phonon case. Right? So that question here will mean you will have to use final and final Q points if you want to go bigger supercell. But your calculation will be with one unit cell. Okay, use the use the microphone. What, what is the importance of this phonon dust and how we can know the top force by looking at this dust phonon dust? How do how to phonon density of state? Yes. I couldn't get into these topics in the thing. I was talking about this phase transition. At high temperatures, you have a cubic, cubic structure, and at low temperature, it's tetragonal with a normal symmetry. And this is what I had shown in the beginning. Raman had done in 1940. There will be a soft phonon associated. So if you calculate its phonon distortion using density functional theory, this is what they do. This is phonon dispersion of the cubic structure of barium titanate and lead titanate. 
You see, you have this imaginary photon frequencies. These are the unstable modes that I pointed out here. In addition to that, you have soft photons here, which will also dominate the free energies of this system. So soft photons, as I explained, cause many things. In fact, I told you that softer the phonon, larger is the dielectric constant. And this is what you see here. You see the dielectric constant in a ferroelectric transition goes to infinity. It diverges at TC because the phonon frequency is going to zero. And dielectric constant is inversely proportional to frequency squared. That's why this is the diverging. So soft phonons are dominating this part completely. No, see, soft phonons, I don't, I won't use the word assure. If they are there in the phonon discussion, they will have implications <coughs> that you can calculate them in thermodynamics. It, it has to be in this. Yeah, it depends on which material you are using. If it has soft phonons, it's very likely to be very interesting. So that I can tell you. Can Yeah, in DOS you will see peaks at very low frequency, below 100 centimeter inverse, which is like 10 milli. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, in many systems, I mean, my most recent work shows uh, very spectacular effect. Nickel titanium is the system, it's a metal. Okay, it's a shape memory alloy, the most important prototypical shape memory alloy. And there was a Nature Materials paper by my PhD advisor only in 2003, which showed that the ground state of nickel titanium is body center of a rhombic structure, BCO structure. If that is the ground state, it cannot have shape memory effect by symmetry. It has to have a B19 prime structure, which is monoclinic structure to give shape memory. And what my work has shown recently is, is the phonon zero point motion, which stabilizes the other ground state actually. And that's how it has. Uh, shape memory frequency. So soft phonons are very important. They can easily give you a different ordering of stability of different phases. Thank you very much. So any other question? Yeah. Sir, last one. <coughs> Suppose I have some negative mode in my phonon dispersion. Does that imply that my structure is not stable or is that phonon mode not uh, allowed for my particular no, It means your structure is unstable in this sense. Absolutely. No question about it. In fact, that's why once you have a phonon dispersion with you, you have a complete picture of what structural instabilities exist in your system. And they guide you which way you should go to lower energy structure which will be stable, more stable than this one. The one which I described is just time independent DFT. But yeah, it should be possible. Okay, thank you very much. So now time is up. Uh, so I think thanks for having me. Please have a 15 minutes coffee break. So after 15 minutes.